Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us at chapel today. We are so excited that you're here. We've got some amazing songs to sing together. And our God is so good. So we just wanted to start off today in this chapel by singing every praise to our wonderful God because he deserves all the glory, even amid the stress of this transition into our new year and the fall. So will you sing this with us? switch gears into this next song I want us to focus on what we've been through today what we're going to endure today everything that God is going to bring us to whatever time of day you're watching this in the morning afternoon or night 
I want us to pray over the day that we have already started, the day that is to come. As we sing how deep the Father's love for us, let us focus on his sacrifice for us. Step into the dark. Oh. 
firm foundation, Lord, when everything around us is not, you are still that firm foundation we can turn to, Jesus. I thank you for that reminder. I thank you for the power in those lyrics, Jesus. You are so good to us. You are so good to us every morning till the evening, Jesus. Every time we wake up to the time we lay our heads down, Lord, you are consistent. You're consistent through the ages. Lord, I pray that um, those words that we will build our life will just just echo in our in the rest in, in our heads the rest of the day, Lord. We love you so much. We thank you for this time that we can just worship you. In your heavenly beautiful name. Amen. Hello, I'm Tatiana Leonard, and I am one of your campus pastors, and I would like to welcome you back to chapel. Um, it, this is very interesting for me. I am in an empty room, and I am this interesting mix of an introvert and an extrovert. And so I enjoy having time alone, but then I also get so much energy and joy from other people being around. And so usually before chapel, I am really nervous. Um, I have so many jitters and I'm excited. And so how I'm able to work through that is just feeling off of you all's just energy. When you're coming into chapel, some of you are running late. Some of you are just so excited. Some of you are exhausted and I'm feed off of that. And right now I'm trying to figure out how I can continue to be an authentic, um, be authentic in front of you while also recognizing that you are in front of your computers or your phones and I just want this to be a pleasant time for you. And so with that being said, can we please just pray before we jump into the university practice for this school year? And so Heavenly Father, I just wanna thank you so much for this day. I pray you open the ears 
and our hearts to your um, precious word, Lord. Connect us through your word and connect us through your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So like I said this morning, we will be going into the university practice. Um, every school year we have a university passage, which this year is Romans 12. And we also select a university practice that our university can engage in together. And what's, you know, what the university practice is, is a spiritual practice that opens us up to the move of God or opens us up to the growth of God. And so this semester, our university practice is community. And I know that this is really difficult because you're like, why now out of every season that we could have been in, why community right now? And this requires us to really rethink community because community is critical. Um, despite us being remote, it is a critical and, is e and an essential tool for us to grow as Christians and, as ch and to also just show the world the love of Christ. And so when we think about community, we think that God is relational. God is relational who wants to have a relationship with you. And God um, desires that we be one as a community. And so God utilizes the body of Christ, you and me, to establish the mission and purpose of God on earth. And so even though we are remote and things may look differently, community is critical and essential for us. But one thing about community is that it's, off, it's often oversold and underdelivered in Christian communities. We think that Christians are, can be just the best friends ever. If you just become a Christian, you will never feel isolated. You will never be lonely. You will have no arguments or no disagreements because we are led by Jesus Christ. But what we see in the Christian community is that we're human and we let each other down over and over again. And so oftentimes community is oversold but underdelivered. And so we want to rethink community. And so when I talk about Christian community, this is what I mean. A community that encourages growth towards the character of Christ. And a community that makes evident Christ's love to the world. And so we know that in this season we are present, presented with some challenges. We are remote, so that means that we need to be intentional with connecting with each other. I know for myself, I, in this season, I want to see your faces, but I also know we need to be intentional. Like, I need a Zoom link. We need to be able to connect our Google calendars and to make sure these things work. There are a few people that can just FaceTime me without any warning, because I need to make sure that I'm ready. <laughs> and and it, it requires intentionality. And so this is a challenge for us. But many of us, we're back home. And I know the reality is that many of you left home for a reason. I know I went as far away as I could for college because I wanted to get away from home. And we are spending so much more time at home than we've ever had before. And so this could present some unique challenges for people who feel just discomfort being back home. I know that if I needed to study at home right now, um, back where I grew up, I would feel so uncomfortable in the place and wouldn't have felt like it was a, a prime opportunity for me to grow and to develop as a student. So many of us are actually experiencing some legitimate discomfort. You're experiencing lack of independence. I know my parents wanted to know everywhere I was going when I left the door. They even complained when I wanted to sleep in. And I understand if you are in that situation, I feel you and I'm sorry that this is a season that we're in. But we're also spending more time with family and friends who may actually share different worldviews than you. And it can be exhausting. Like, I can only imagine living with my parents in this specific election year. <laughs> it could be exhausting or always hearing that, oh, you go off to college and you think you know everything now. And you're in this, you're in the situation day in and day out. And I understand and it presents challenges for our community. But another thing is that in this pandemic, it has required us to slow down and to adjust to a new normal. And so that means that we actually have less things to fill our time with. And I am guilty of it. 
And so it means that we are exposed to many underlying issues within ourselves and in our community. And so I know that this time of slowing down and not just having so many things to fill my time with has exposed so many issues that I have not dealt with or that I thought I was over, or areas of unforgiveness that I thought I was over, but this time of slowing has revealed that I haven't or even things in our society that we thought we had a good handle on. But in the slowing, we've been able to see that we haven't. And one thing that I've actually realized is that the realities of others have also been exposed to me. I wanna share a picture of you, and this is a picture in my backyard, and, and what you see is a jumper. That's my daughter, Eden, who's three and a half, and our neighbor, Logan. And you see that there's a little space in between the trees, and that's my neighbor, Anthony, Logan's father. And we had a tree there um, in that open space that actually died. And I was upset about it because it was an investment, and it was, it was something that we invested in for privacy. The tree died, and what happened was we literally got to see our neighbors for the first time in four years. We got to see our neighbors. We got to get to know them. And I realized that there were so many missed opportunities that we had to know my neighbors, to actually have a relationship with them. But this season of slowing, this season where this tree actually just died, <laughs> allowed us to have our eyes opened to our neighbors. And so what I wanted to do was to utilize this passage that brings into focus our missed opportunities to show the love of Christ to our neighbors. So think about this, this tree. Think about this opportunity where we're frustrated. We bought this tree for privacy. The tree dies, but now it allows us to actually see our neighbors and get to know them. And they have truly been a blessing to us in this season. And so the passage that I would like to get into is Luke chapter 10. If you were able to view last Friday's um, chapel with Dr. Keith Hall, he also referred to this chapel, but we're going to take a different angle. So I want you to just bear with me. So Luke chapter 10 is the parable of the Good Samaritan. And I want to take some time to just quickly summarize this for you. And so there's a scribe who comes to Jesus. He is an expert in the law. It is his job to teach and to interpret the law. And he comes to Jesus and he has this question. He says, how do I inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, you know the law. You know, you know it. Tell me, what does it say? And the scribe says, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And so he goes on and, he, and he's like, you are correct. Okay, go live your life. Like this, the, the laws are summed up in this. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. But this scribe wanting and desiring to justify himself, he says, but who is my neighbor? And so Jesus, instead of just saying, everyone is your neighbor, he, he gives this story. And he says, on this road from Jerusalem to Jericho, there is a man who is beaten and robbed and left half dead. And on the way, on this road, there's a priest who sees this man left half dead and he walks to the other side of the street and continues on with his day. And then there's a Levite who also sees this man half dead but goes to the other side of the street. But then there's a Samaritan, a person who's actually despised in this society, sees the man, takes pity on him, and takes care of him. He goes above and beyond to take care of this person. And so what we see in this passage are we see these major themes in Luke 10 of reasons to justify inaction, dismantling of ethnic stereotypes, and blatant avoidance and apathy from religious leaders. And so when we think about reasons to justify our inaction, we can see this in Luke chapter 10, verse 29. It says, but when he wanted to justify himself, he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And 
He asked this question because he is actually someone who teaches the law and interprets the law. And he was trying to find a way to clear himself of responsibility. And I want to ask you, why is he trying to clear himself of this responsibility? Because leaders like himself taught that only Jews were your neighbor. And in this passage, it doesn't tell us the guy who's beaten and robbed and left half dead. It doesn't say what his ethnicity is, but we can assume that he wasn't Jewish. And so he wants to clear his conscience and he wants to do the very, like the bare minimum before God. And says, look, if it isn't an an issue, if it isn't a Jewish issue, then it isn't going to impact my life. So I'm going to go to the other side of the street and I'm going to keep walking. And so he's looking for ways to justify himself. But we also see this dismantling of a very serious stereotype about the Samaritans. And so in um, verse 33, we see this. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look at him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you any extra expense you may have. And so the Samaritan, he's, it's, it, we're coming into focus on the Samaritan who's actually an ethnic enemy of the Jews because they are a mixed race. They're stereotyped as lazy, violent, and immoral. But this person sees someone in need. They get messy and dirty. Can you imagine someone who's beaten and they're left half dead? You can imagine the blood that's on their own clothes and how they're willing to get messy and dirty to bandage their wounds. And then it also says that they gave the innkeeper two denarii, which in that time would have been enough to um, cover three weeks expenses. And so we see that this Samaritan is committed to the man's restoration. And we see this in the story, and Jesus asks the question, who proves to be the neighbor? And the scribe has to admit that it is the the Samaritan, the one who showed pity, the one who went above and beyond. And Jesus says, go and do the same. And so when we're talking about Christian community, when we're thinking about the, the purpose of Christian community is for us to grow in the character of Christ. And it's also for us to show the world Christ's love. I want us to sit, seriously consider what causes us, as people who are believers of Jesus Christ, what causes us to go to the other side of the street. And so I wanted to think about what are the things that we intentionally avoid or why do we simply not care about issues around us? And so I was thinking of maybe we're afraid. This road was actually a dangerous road. It was called the bloody pass. And so people probably considered that this, if I try to engage in this, this will be dangerous for me. When I think about this particular season, COVID is a real reality for us. And some of us may be considering our own health and say, you know what? I need to walk to the other side of the street because it is dangerous for me to engage right now. And so we may walk to the other side of the street because we are sincerely afraid. But we also may feel like there's more essential work for us to focus on. The priest and the Levite both had work to do. They worked in the temple. And they may have believed that what what I'm getting to is more important than, than helping this man right now. Another reason we may hide behind our faith, not just believing that we have more essential work to do, but we may also feel like we actually need to pray about it. We need to spend some time considering and discerning what is God asking me to do about this person in need. 
So we're unsure if God is calling us to help in this specific way. I know when I've hidden behind my faith, I've said, you know what? That's not my call. That's, God's not calling me to this specific area of need. And I've hidden behind my faith or I've even procrastinated through prayer by saying, I, I'm going to walk across the street and I'm going to pray for this person versus being the answer to the prayer. We may also just be apathetic altogether, knowing that if it doesn't directly affect me or my family, I, I don't need to care about these issues. Or what I've seen in our society today is that we need more details before we can act. We walk to the other side of the street to get a better look. We walk to the other side of the street to evaluate. And what happens is sometimes we become so critical and even cynical about the situation altogether. We end up upset that we even had to walk across the street and to even focus on this issue or we get upset that this is even a disruption in our lives. So we start to question, why are you in this situation? Are you a criminal? Did, is this just what you deserved? Were you irresponsible? Are you, sir, are you sober? Are you even a Christian? As if we need these details in order for us to invest our time and resources. And so I want us to ask that question of what are some of the reasons why we are going to the other side of the street? But finally, I want to talk about what may have caused the, the priests and Levites to actually walk to the other side of the street is the priest and Levite would have become ceremonially unclean by touching this man. They, wouldn't been, they would not have been able to do their essential duties in the temple because they would have been ceremonially unclean by touching the blood. And some of us, we're also concerned about what others think. Could you imagine being a priest, knowing that you had essential duties in the temple and you have blood all over you? And people are saying, you cannot do your job today because you actually helped someone today. And sometimes, especially when it comes to polarizing issues, we, we result in inaction because we are so concerned about what others may think that we stepped in or that we attempted to do something. And because of all of these various reasons, the priest, the Levite, the people who knew God, the people who knew the word of God were inactive and they left work undone. And the least likely person steps in to help and show the love of God. A Samaritan steps in because the people of God left work undone. And this reminds me of even in the book of Esther, where Esther is reluctant to speak to the king on behalf of the Jews. But her cousin Mordecai reminds her in Esther chapter four, if you keep silent at this time, liberation and deliverance will come to the Jewish people from another place. But you and your father's house will be destroyed. Who knows, perhaps you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. And so help came from another place. A Samaritan, a person in which the society believed no good thing could come of, goes above and beyond. Help came from another place. I want to remind us that when we're talking about Christian community, the purpose of Christian community is for us to grow, grow in the likeness and character of Christ, but for us to also show the love of Christ to the world. And what we are seeing in this passage and what we are seeing over and over in our society are missed opportunities to show the love of Christ. And I, what I want us to understand is that it is critical for us to stop walking to the other side of the street. Our world, our nation, we're all looking for a plan and we're all looking for direction. And it can come forth from us, but we are walking to the other side of the street. We are leaving work undone. 
And unfortunately, the good news of Christ, that, that God loved us so much that he sent his son to die for our sins, that we can be empowered through the spirit of God, that we can be one people through, through spirit and truth. That good news right now is no longer good news to our neighbor when we walk to the other side of the street. And I also want to say when, when secular solutions arise because we have left work undone as a church, as believers, we have left work undone. And so when secular solutions arise, I wanna challenge you to not just become critical of how they're going about it and how they're doing this work, but I want us to actually repent because Christian inaction and Christian apathy has led to secular solutions. And what I mean by that, the church and its believers could literally be leading the way in issues like racial justice, healthcare, education, protecting children, sex trafficking, fighting hunger and homelessness, justice reform, caring for the immigrant, the widow, the prisoner, and the marginalized. We could literally be leading the way in these issues. However, secular solutions have come to the forefront because we have left work undone. And this is how we can love our neighbor. We can love our neighbor by staying on the side of the street and, and actually and, and intentionally helping the people right in front of us. And with us being remote right now, with us literally being all over the globe as an APU community, that means that we will have a global impact because we are no longer walking to the other side of the street. So wherever you find yourself, at home, on campus, abroad, wherever you find yourself, I want us to really um, reflect on how God is calling us to engage where we are, where, where our temporary communities may be right now, back home, but also how you can engage in your APU community because it would be so easy for us to say in this season, I just wanna focus on myself, and I wanna focus on school. And if we're able to get back in the spring, then I can start to, to, to lean into community when I get there in person. But I wanna challenge that because we know that community is critical and we know that we need each other. And so I want you to ask that question, how have you walked to the other side of the street? How have you intentionally avoided community and showing the love of Christ to others? And I pray that this parable continues to convict us, but also lead us to compassion. And so I pray that this word resonates and stays with you. Have a great rest of your day.